for those of you who don't know, the demand for H-1Bs is greater than its supply. H-1Bs are for professional workers. Um, so each year we file on April 1st, that's what I was talking about with June's maternity leave, um, and then USCIS runs a lottery um, to choose which cases it's going to adjudicate. And we have our fingers crossed for everybody that we file for, but um, overall, given the number that, were, that was received this year, we expect around 40% to be chosen. Uh, we're starting to get um, a number of receipt notices in the mail right now, and in fact, we've even received some approvals, which actually is kind of surprising compared to last year, but um, maybe they were the easy cases. Um, so if, if it runs according to national statistics, we will have about, you know, actually 38% approvals. So what are the alternatives for people who do not get chosen in the visa lottery? And I'm not going to talk about these specifically, but I'm just going to run through the very many options um, as just sort of the agenda for what we're going to, what the panel's going to talk about, um, and then they're they're going to get into the specifics. So, B1 visitor for business uh, business visitors or trainees. Um, H1B specialty occupation. I'm not sure. <coughs> CAP exempt. Oh, CAP exempt, I'm sorry. Um, J1, trainees and interns. E1 or E2, treaty traders and investors. L1, intracompany transferees. O1, for extraordinary, uh, I don't like to say the word alien, I try never to say the word alien. <laughs> extraordinary workers or extraordinary people in the arts, sciences, and business. Uh, P1, P2, P3, entertainers, athletes, artists, depending on your kind of business, I suppose. Country-specific options, TN for Mexicans or Canadians, E3 for Australians, H1B1 for those from Chile and Singapore. So sometimes we forget that people are from these um, certain countries that would um, enable them to get an option to an H1B. Um, OPT extensions for STEM occupations, and we'll, I mentioned that may go away, but we'll see. Uh, only available to employers on E-Verify. Curricular optional practical training. <coughs> H4 employment authorization, uh, which may go away. And other options for spouses. There are other spouses that can get EADs, work authorizations. So sometimes you have a situation where two spouses, you know, two married people, one is on an H-1B uh, and, or an L-1, and, and the other person has applied for an H-1B but doesn't get chosen in the lottery. So uh, with that, I'm going to go first to Bob um, to talk about H-1B specialty occupation. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, let me talk a little bit, since we're talking about H-1B workarounds, let's just make sure that we have a common understanding of what an H-1B is, and then we'll move into why we need to look at some workaround situations. H-1B, by its definition, is a temporary visa classification that is widely used to authorize the employment of foreign professionals in the United States. So the, the key concept is that H-1B, in a rather, in, in optimally a rather time efficient manner, will give an employer the right to hire a foreign national for up to, normally up to six years, um, in a professional level position. So the, the screening devices would be the position has to be at a professional level, the foreign national has to have the responsive, appropriate professional level background, and there is a requirement to demonstrate that the employment will take place under acceptable non-discriminatory wage and working conditions. So that's the basic construct of H-1B. Within that, you have kind of three phenomena going on, which is the reason we have this hour-long session on the workarounds. And that's not to say that the three phenomena 
arose in order to give us the opportunity to do this, we're responding to those phenomena. First of all, you have the law itself. That is, the statute that set up H-1B, the Immigration Nationality Act, um, creates a numerical limitation, a quota on the number of H-1Bs. And that quota is there are 65,000 H-1B visa numbers in the U.S. immigration system, and then an additional 20,000 become available for foreign nationals holding uh, graduate advanced degrees from U.S. universities. So it has to be from a U.S. institution. So maximum is 85,000. If you don't have a a, or 65,000 if uh, you don't have an advanced degree. Well, the demands on those numbers far exceed the quota limitation. That is, um, the, this year, immigration received about 190,000 H-1B petitions chasing after 85,000 or 65,000, again, depending on if the foreign national qualifies for the expanded 85,000 number or the more restricted 65,000. So first of all, you have a disequilibrium of supply and demand, okay? Secondly, even within the, um, the numerical limitations, what we're seeing today is a spike, is an increase in challenges and even denials of H-1Bs. I mean, H-1B is still a very desirable visa, very attainable, but it requires a good deal more preparation and care because you've had a series of um, instructions, largely, thus far largely from the, fe the federal agencies, which are um, issuing and expressing a more restrictive attitude to things like what is a specialty occupation? What is a legitimate um, requirement for a professional? And in particular, because this has become somewhat of a political hot football, uh, the IT professions, which is a major uh, utilizer of the H-1B program, but there's a belief that the employment of foreign nationals in IT professions displaces U.S. workers. So as a result, there's certain explicit um, instructions that seem to have a narrowing effect, particularly on IT professional H-1Bs. And then, so you have the, the law itself creating certain restrictions. You have certain overt instructions. And then... Three, we are seeing an attitude within the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, to more skeptically address and um, the, the eligibility for H-1B approval. So it's not just a question that we're seeing restrictive adjudications on things like um, what constitutes a special occupation, but we're seeing USCIS challenging wage issues, that is, which is something normally within the province of the Department of Labor. So what you've got, and, and I, I don't mean to over-exaggerate, but you know, I think that there is a little bit of a cowboy mentality right now in terms of USCIS feeling quite empowered and, 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 and quite um, capable of engaging in wide-ranging uh, adjudications um, certainly to an extent that I don't think we've ever seen in the past. I mean, I've been practicing 32 years, and um, to get from point A to point B is a challenge, okay? And again, H-1B is a very logical, very desirable visa application, um, and it's just a question of the level of care and the, the absence you can make of assumptions that, that USCIS will kind of be giving the benefit of the doubt. Okay, now, um, I wanna get to just some of the basic constructs of the cap-exempt, cap-exempt. We're gonna, 
uh, cap exempt and, and cap subject. You have two types of H-1B sponsorships available. One type is subject to the numerical limitation. So if, if you have a situation in which your H-1B sponsorship is subject to the numerical limitation, what that in essence means is that you've got to make your employment decisions, submit your sponsorships uh, for receipt at USCIS on April 1. So the, the application period for new H-1Bs opens April 1, at which time immigration gets inundated with these 190,000 um, H-1B visa petitions. What they do, once, once they, they overfill, oversubscribe their numbers, they institute a lottery program, which is a random selection of H-1B petitions, and then from that randomly selected corpus of H-1B petitions, they then adjudicate on the merits in terms of determining, is this a specialty occupation? Is the foreign national fully qualified? Um, has the employer gone through the um, qualification process initially conducted through the Department of Labor on non-discrimination and satisfaction of the, of the wage standards, okay? If there is an approval, then the H-1B becomes effective October 1. And what, and in part, and I think Yosef is going to drive the discussion, which is um, what are some of the considerations or options, in particular for students, in terms of bridging the gap leading up to October 1. Okay, that's the general scenario for CAP subject, H-1Bs. But then the law goes on to say that there are going to be certain situations that are exempted from the H-1B quota. So here, again, you need to show specialty occupation, you need to show the foreign nationals' professional stature. You need to show wage and working condition issues, but you're not limited to a specific application period. So if a case is CAP subject, I'm sorry, CAP, my senior moment, CAP exempt, then the sponsorship can take place at any time of the year. The approval can, can be issued at any time of the year. And you're no longer bootstrapped into this April 1 application and October 1 approval date. So what, what are some of the um, major categories? I'm going to come back to this. It is university institutions are exempted, nonprofit university affiliated institutions. Um, and uh, individuals working at, uh, so, so a, you know, Fredrickson and Byron, a for-profit entity, if we were to hire an H-1B and place them on the premises of the University of St. Thomas, for example, we could derive H-1B exemption from that. Again, all of these things are highly desirable in terms of giving a, a, a level of flexibility. So what you've got is a, a sustained focus on what are the options to gain exemption from the H-1B quota, okay? So um, actually, we've got the slide, which is probably also a hint I need to get going. Um, so what we want to talk about a little bit in, in, in greater depth is what are the situations in which a case could be filed on a cap-exempt basis. Usually the, the key to an exemption lies with the identity of the employer or the identity of the place of employment. So universities are exempt from the H-1B quota. Nonprofit university affiliated institutions, paradigmatically, that would be, at least in my experience, is teaching hospitals, but it's certainly well beyond that. Um, institutions that maintain formal structured uh, 
relationships with the university and our nonprofit. They can sponsor H-1Bs exempted from the quota. Government research institutions, again, this can be fairly limited. You have situations in which concurrent employment. So let's say that someone uh, is being employed in an H-1B part-time position at the University of St. Thomas or University X, that H-1B can be filed in a cap-exempt manner. And the balance of the employment relationship, which would require a second H-1B, given the fact that H-1B is employer-specific, the second H-1B covering a concurrent uh, employment situation would derive or pick up the exemption from the fact that the part-time employment is being conducted by a, is, is being maintained by a university or, or a cap-exempt institution. Um, so, um, and then I'd mention very briefly that if a for-profit entity is placing, and it has to be for a substantial period of time, you know, it's not a casual uh, placement, um, uh, at a cap-exempt entity. So again, for-profit, Fredrickson and Byron, hiring someone, placing them on the premises of a university, for example, or a teaching hospital, whatever, that in those instances, the H-1B filed by a for-profit company can be can gain an exemption. What does this suggest? It does suggest that if you are su normally subject to the H-1B quota, and therefore cap subject, um, but there are reasons for you to seriously pursue the H-1B employment, you might seek to structure a, the employment position to involve a cap-exempt entity, at least as a place of employment, with the view of deriving, bootstrapping yourself into a, um, a, um, you know, a cap-exempt situation. And I should also note that if you're recruiting an H, uh, a foreign national who has previously been the beneficiary of an approved H-1B petition that was counted against the H-1B cap, you would derive the ability to also file your own H-1B on a cap-exempt basis. Look, in the brief time we have, all my, my, the basic point of, of this segment is to identify there are the, the desirability and oftentimes the necessity of initiating the employment of a foreign national through the H-1B temporary worker classification, the challenge existing in the cap subject and cap exempt arena to identify very briefly that we're getting more and more skepticism substantively in those adjudications, but also to suggest that if you are cap subject, there may be, there may very well be options to structure the employment in a manner to gain an exemption from the H-1B cap. And it seems to me that is an issue that requires some thinking out of the box and in close cooperation with, with the Immigration Council. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, Yosef, tell us about F-1 students. So switching gears from the H-1B, another way to get um, employment authorization is through the F-1 visa, which that allows students to come over to attend um, school full-time in the United States. And after a year of full-time study, they can get uh, employment. Um, there are two basic ways to do that. Um, there's optional practical training, and there's curricular practical training, um, CPT and OPT. Uh, in both cases, the point is that it corresponds to the student's major. So they're getting some uh, furtherance of what they're learning through their university courses. Um, CPT is limited to one specific employer and for a specific period of time. And CPT is usually handled through the university itself, through the designated student official, 
um, the student goes to that person and uh, the, the school usually has a relationship with an employer and they'll get authorization that way. Um, there's no, um, there's nothing required from the immigration service. That's different from OPT, which does require approval um, from the immigration service, but which allows a student to uh, be employed anywhere um, that they can find related to their major. So there's a little more flexibility there. Um, then from the OPT, you can also qualify for a two-year extension if you have a degree in STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, those really um, kind of in-demand majors right now um, that, uh, that we feel we need to get more graduates from. Um, the STEM extension requires the employer to be an E-Verify employer, and it also requires them to, to draft a training plan along with uh, the, the student, um, and then submit that to the immigration service. And that's typically something we can help with. Um, so the thing to note about both OPT and um, STEM OPT is that when a student moves from one level of education, for example, from a bachelor's degree to a master's degree, they can qualify for additional time, an additional year of work authorization. And so the example um, we sometimes give is that a student um, gets her degree in engineering and can get a 24, uh, can get a year of OPT and then extend that by 24 months. So that's three years of, of employment authorization. And then let's say she go, goes back to school because she really likes engineering and gets a master's degree then she can qualify for another year OPT and then another STEM extension. And that can be six years of total employment time. And within that time, her employer may be trying to um, qualify for H-1B through the lottery. So that's six shots at the lottery, um, which this year was 40%, so uh, your chances increase. So even if she doesn't really like engineering or going back to school, <laughs> it still might be a st strategy for someone who loses out in the lottery, right? You know, so. That's exactly right. Um, and I think on the next slide, there's, there's one issue there um, currently with third-party placement for um, these uh, OPT uh, people on, on employment <laughs> authorization. Um, and this was something that came out on an ICE web page where they said that um, students needed to be employed at the headquarters of a company. Um, they, they didn't follow the proper method for um, laying out that regulation if that's going to be enforced, but it's just something uh, to flag and that will keep you kind of updated on if we do see issues with this, um, with placing students at third party work sites when they're working for an employer. Okay, thanks, Bob. We're back to you to talk about business visitors. Okay, thanks so much. Look, um, when you talk, the reason that, that in large measure we're talking about the option of looking at the B uh, visa classification, it, it's in large measure an effort to keep a foreign national in the United States and to provide them with the uh, option to remain physically present in this country. So what B, there, there, there are two subsets of Bs. One is B1, visitor for business, and the other is B2, visitor for pleasure. The whole essential notion, and I'll, I'll focus on the B1, is basically to provide a visa authorization that will let someone come on a business trip, someone to come to negotiate a contract, attend uh, seminars or business meetings, uh, investigate, uh, even investigate job possibilities or investment possibilities. So the whole notion of uh, a B is to provide a period of time, normally for up to six months, um, 
that will enable a foreign national to come to the United States, but not to work, but rather to engage in business discussions, business investigations. Um, but what's kind of interesting is that you have the, the general notion of B kind of being correlated solely to uh, business trips. And by the way, I should note that B's do not involve any type of sponsorship. It's a direct application by the foreign national, if they're abroad, to a U.S. consular official to authorize a issuance of a B visa, letting them come into the United States. Or if they're from certain countries, they can come in under the visa waiver program. So the turnaround time for B visa issuance is normally quite quick, although given the attitudes within the U.S. consulates, there's increased scrutiny if someone intends to come in temporarily as required for B purposes, or if they're using the B as kind of a subterfuge to um, go into uh, permanent residence. But what I just kind of wanted to, to highlight just a little bit is that while B's, B, B in, its, in the main is limited to business trips, business discussions, um, there is some instances where a B could cover certain activities uh, that might be productively useful. So for example, if a foreign com company sells to the United States a piece of equipment and in the uh, sales contract, there's a provision for maintenance and installment. A foreign, the, the, the foreign um, uh, kind of maintenance and installment team can come down, work in the United States, pursuant to that contract, and that could be under B. There's also a provision, uh, it's called B1 in lieu of H1B or H3. And it says that if a foreign national is abroad uh, and is going to be coming into the United States to perform um, duties that would normally be performed by an employee, but the source of remuneration, the source of salary is from a for the foreign entity. So the, pay, the paycheck is coming from the foreign entity, although this, the, the individual is working in the United States. That potentially is a valid B-1 activity. However, you need to present the merits of the case at the consulate and get the, cons the, the visa issued, noting that it is B-1 in lieu of H-1B. So in other words, you can't you can't come into the United States and then move into this kind of quasi-employment situation. It has to be vetted and cleared, and for a variety of reasons, the consulates are becoming more and more constrictive in their allowance of this uh, type of activity. But at least it's something to get visa status above and beyond simply coming in for the business trip it, it would extend to allowing for certain productive activities. And there, there are a couple other things. But I think that in our context, which is kind of the, B1, the H-1B workaround, Bs can be a, a, an alternative, at least allowing the foreign national to lawfully remain in the United States while things are getting sorted out, in a sense. Great. Deborah, tell us about trainees. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I may scoot up closer. Closer. Good. Great. So J-1 trainees. So J-1s are a unique hybrid because you actually don't deal with the immigration service. So often when people hear that, they get very excited. Oh, there's a visa. I can avoid uh, the immigration service. And here's why. So the J-1 program is actually run by the Department of State. 
Um, and what this is, it's an agreement to allow someone who's an intern or a trainee to work at your company as long as they are gaining skills that will train them in a particular role. And the main component of the entire visa is to show that you've created a training plan. So you need to have a supervisor. You need to show what they will learn over, say, an 18-month period. Um, but as long as they're not just solely in productive employment, they actually need to be gaining skills that they will use to enhance their career, the J-1 is a really good alternative in certain circumstances when you aren't successful with an H-1B. However, you, the important part is to show that you are going to be able to have um, a detailed plan. Um, the individual, usually they're looking for a foreign degree abroad. This doesn't work so well with your STEM individuals or your OPT individuals because normally the Department of State will assume they've already had training. That's what the OPT and STEM OPT is for. So they're not looking to provide supplemental training in a J-1 situation. Though we've had success in some circumstances, uh, for example, we did it for an architect because under U.S. law, you're required to have a certain number of years of training to get your degree. And so we were able to supplement OPT with J-1 training to enable them to get a degree and then go for an H-1B later. Um, what's also unique about the J-1 program is that you use a third-party agency. So the Department of State has a list of nonprofit companies that is allowed to issue what's called a DS-2019, which is the form that um, allows them to obtain a J-1 visa. So you again, you don't file with the Immigration Service, but you're going to pay fees to a third party who's going to review and approve your training plan. They're going to interview you as the supervisor. They're going to interview the employee uh, trainee, shouldn't call them the employee, the employee trainee uh, to confirm they have the English language skills and understand what their training is for and they have to get their visa outside the country that's something to be uh, once it's approved they then have to get the visa to come in uh, the caveat to look out for is there's something in the Immigration and Nationality Act called 212E, which is a two-year home residence requirement that certain individuals can trigger based on what's called a skills list or if there's government funding. And generally, when you're looking at a trainee, it's going to be based on the skills list. So certain countries, such as China, um, almost all their uh, nationals are subject to a skills list, so it's things you have to be aware of. Because what that means is once you've had that employee, they can still get the J-1 and they were able to work for you, but they now have to go back to their home country for two years before they can change status to an H-1B or get a green card. Now, there is a waiver process in certain circumstances, but depending on the nationality of the person you're sponsoring, that's something we'd want to look through. But for the most part, big fans of J-1s, they can be processed fairly quickly in a matter of two months. Um, for the most part, um, send, them, send them out to get a visa, they come back in, they can start their training program, and then you can look at what options there are for you next year to potentially try for an H-1B. Similar is an H-3, and you think, we have two trainee visas? We do. Um, the H-3 is different because you control this one. There's no third-party sponsor. The H-3 is filed by the employer. It can be granted for up to two years, but it is more so for educational training than on-the-job training. Um, in fact, you have to have a detailed plan that explains kind of what we call kind of classroom training. It works really well if you're sending, for example, a group of employees from abroad to the U.S. because of certain technology that's being manufactured or set up in the U.S. And you're saying, I need these six people here for one year because they're going to be doing this job in the Philippines. We could prepare an H-3 that can include multiple employees in one training plan to bring them here to gain that education and knowledge that they're going to need to use abroad. So it's really useful in those circumstances. Uh, it also allows for premium processing, so you can get a decision quickly. Uh, but something to be aware of, the USCIS is skeptical of H-3s because they really want to see that they're training and not coming here to work. Because there's no LCA, there's no wage obligations, and so they don't want to see this abused. And so with that, they are uh, heavily scrutinized, but can be very successful as long as you're very careful in establishing a good training plan, um, good supervision, um, it's well detailed, you've prepped the individuals before they come over, um, it's a useful category in the right circumstances. Great, there's a lot of alphabet soup here. Um, <laughs> Yosef, tell us about O1s. So kind of the flip side of trainees, O1s are for those who are at the highest level of their field. Th these are people who have, ex have received extensive training and have risen to the top of their field. Um, and 
this can be a lot of different fields. I think we have listed here arts, athletics, science, or business. Um, we can qualify someone for an O-1 in a range of, of fields. It just depends on whether they satisfy these criteria that need to be met and whether we can present them as being at the very top of their field, that is having international acclaim and um, being recognized by others um, as, being, as being extraordinary. Um, the, the approval uh, goes for three years and then can be extended in one-year increments pretty much indefinitely. So this can get you a lot of years under O-1, but it is a temporary visa, so it's not permanent status in the United States. Um, adjudication for these can be very quick because we can use premium processing, but the prep time for, for this type of submission <coughs> is usually lengthy because we'll need to get letters from outside experts saying that this person is extraordinary. We'll need to get a lot of documentation from the person, all the articles they've ever written, uh, the presentations they've given, um, a, a lot of kind of documentation for why they're extraordinary. Um, basically, these types of visas apply for someone who has a really lengthy resume and we can help evaluate, you know, we can take a look at those resumes and, and figure out if someone would qualify for this very uh, kind of high level visa. So we do a lot of O1s in our, in our shop here um, for scientists and researchers. And also we do a lot of work for artists. But I would say that it's important to remember that business people can qualify as O1s. And I, I think that's a pretty un underutilized category by other uh, lawyers out there. So it's something um, that we try to remember. And it's possible often, um, even in these days of extreme vetting, that um, a high-level employee might qualify for an O1. Can, can I just add two words, sure, please? Sure. Um, word number one is, over this past period of time, we've seen O1s be pretty liberally adjudicated. So, so the, the standard extraordinary ability is a pretty daunting term. Whether it will continue or not is, is open to question, but, but the, the recognition of the liberality of USCIS adjudication has been pretty high. So it's, to, to reiterate what Laura is saying, it, it, it really can become an, a, um, a viable alternative. Point number two, Yosef was talking about someone who's risen to the top of their profession. And because I'm always kind of intrigued with this, because as a practitioner or as a, an employer, you have the right to define what that profession is. And oftentimes, the, the more narrow that term is defined, you know, rather than being a business person, rather this person is a uh, technology transfer uh, professional dealing with uh, Asia, for example, that, that kind of restricts the universe in which you have to show that you're risen to the top of the profession. And we, we, we systematically do that type of narrowing in a credible manner. And I think that becomes the real springboard to a one approval. So we've gotten an O1 for a bread baker, a master bread baker, uh, who was teaching Minnesotans how to appreciate and eat and bake really great bread quite a long time ago. Um, and we got an O1 one time for a stripper for a music video for a very well-known artist <laughs> in town. Not that you're employing that many strippers, but I just thought I'd mention it. Uh, <laughs> Deborah, um, tell us about the rest of our alphabet soup. L1s, E3s, TNs, so forth. After that fun lead-in, OK. <laughs> so how many people here work for companies that have a parent or a subsidiary or affiliate outside the US? Raise your hands. OK, so I'm talking for you. This is called the L1 category. And it's for multinational managers, executives, or specialized knowledge workers. And they're only available for companies who qualify as qualifying entities. So it requires you to have a parent company, a subsidiary, and a, or affiliate, or a joint venture. I'm looking at you back there, um, in order to be able to transfer workers between your entities. Um, it sounds like this should be a very straightforward application, right? They 
they work in England, you want to bring them to the U.S., they're a manager, they should be able to work here. Unfortunately, immigration got its dirty little claws into this well-used visa and has made this into a much more complicated category than, in my feeling, it should. Um, I've given entire one and a half hour lectures on this topic and I won't do that for you, but to talk about the complexity of how they've taken a very simple regulation that's only a few lines long and have created 20 page memos outlining who's an executive, who's a manager, and what qualifies for specialized knowledge. So because of this, we continue to use this often because this really is what it's then there for, right? This is what the law is to allow these companies to bring people over, but how we have to prove up how your people are executives or managers with specialized knowledge becomes very detailed. First rule, they have to have worked for you for at least one full year out of the last three years. One new thing they're looking at is they're checking your employees' travel records. And if, say, they were hired within one year and they've spent maybe two months traveling back and forth to the U.S., we have seen them subtract that from your one year of employment abroad and delay your ability to file your applications. So we have to look at your individual's travel history. And then in terms of defining executives or managerial role, they really want to make sure that these are true leaders, decision-making, and strategists, and God forbid they actually engage in work during the day, right? They want to see some they want to see subordinates. They love org charts. They love dotted lines, hard lines to show that other people are doing the complicated day-to-day -day jobs, kind of like our paralegals and us as lawyers. They're doing all the hard work. We're just kind of talking it out loud over and over again. Um, that's what they're looking at for L. So you really have to define your job duties. We're going to include detailed percentages um, to prove up the case. Um, these can be applied for at the service center with an expedite processing, so you can get a decision fairly quickly. If you happen to be Canadian, you can still apply directly at the border, which for the most part has still been the most liberal adjudication coming through Canada. There is a pilot project going on at the Blaine port um, where they're, they're saying, it's so great, why don't you file your petition in advance? We're going to give it to USCIS, and then we'll let you know if you can come in. I don't know about you, but how many people are going to volunteer to go through immigration USCIS except for CBP? One of the fears we have is that this may be the future, that they're looking to take away CBP from adjudication and give it solely to USCIS, which I think would make it much harder. For those of you who are large companies uh, who either have a certain earnings, um, a certain number of L's that they do a year, or a certain number of entities abroad, you can apply for what's called a blanket L. And this allows you to send individuals directly to the, U the consulates abroad in their home country to request their L1, and it'll be adjudicated at the consular level. Um, that's still available for those individuals and is also an excellent way to transfer uh, individuals coming over. Um, what's also nice for your employees is that spouses will get employment authorization. There's very few visas in the U.S code that allows spouses to work, but L's are one of them. Also, the L is only good for your company. So I know a lot of times when you file an H-1B, our clients are nervous to say, we invested all this time and money in the individual, and now they're going to go work for someone else. The L is only good for you. It's only good for your business. So you have a bit more security uh, when you are investing in them coming over to the states. Um, it also has a counterpart for a green card. So if they are key workers and people you want to keep here, if we've been successful in the L1A, there's a very strong chance we'll be successful doing the, the opposite track for a green card to keep them here permanently. Okay. And now I'm going to talk about uh, com con country specific. So this depends on what country you're from. So it's kind of like winning the place of birth lottery and getting a visa to come work in America. Um, so the first I'm talking about is Australia. From down under, our good friends have a special visa. These are created by treaty. So this is why they're unique and they haven't been impacted as much is because they are established by treaty. Um, and essentially the E3 allows if you're an Australian and you're working in a specialty occupation, so it has a similar definition as the H1B, um, you can apply directly for an E3 visa at the U.S. consulate in Australia. Um, and come in and work. Um, there's not a limitation. There's not a six-year cap. You can continue working and working. Uh, the only difference is it has non-immigrant intent. It doesn't have the dual intent that you see for an H-1B, but an excellent um, category for Australians. Similar to Chile and Singapore, uh, the difference is it has only a one-year um, you only get it one year at a time, so you have to keep renewing it, which is 
a pain. Um, but otherwise, uh, while there are a limited number, they've never been used up. So it's fairly straightforward to, again, apply at the consulate and bring people over. So when you're doing your recruiting, while we can't look at national origin, it's a plus in certain circumstances if you find out where they're from. So why we may ask you, do you know where they're born? Seems like a very strange question, or where they're a citizen. It's very, very pertinent in determining what type of um, sponsorship may be available. Um, what you've seen the most probably, and I'm speeding through because we're cutting on time. That's my job. I move actually, ahead. Actually, I think we're pretty good. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I'll slow down. <laughs> TNs, NAFTA. So many of us use TNs um, frequently. Why? Because we're in Minnesota and Canada is just so close. So Canadians and Mexicans under NAFTA, um, which until it gets renegotiated, uh, is still in place, um, allows for individuals who work in enumerated 72 occupations are listed in NAFTA. If you are going to be working in one of those occupations and have the qualifying degree, many require a bachelor's degree, uh, some require an associate's degree and a few years experience. Um, you can request through a job offer, proof of your citizenship, uh, to enter the country for three years to work for that employer who sponsored you. So very straightforward, can be applied for at the border, or you can file within the U.S. if you're already here in another status to change status. We have seen um, some mixture going on at the border. For some reason, Canada is being tougher than Mexico, in my opinion, right now with TNs. We have seen people challenging um, computer systems analysts coming in, um, IT software engineers, because those are the only two occupations listed in NAFTA. What we've seen is individuals who are working at higher levels, for example, IT managers, and they're saying, you're not a software engineer, you're a manager. So how you craft your job offer and your position is going to be very delicate these days um, and very careful uh, when you send your individuals to the border. Um, and also, the odd thing we've seen is, you no. Know, TNs does not have immigrant intent. Again, you have to return at some point to return back to Canada. And we have seen individuals who've sold their home ready. They got the ready to move to the U.S. They have this great job offer. And I've seen cases where they're being denied by CBP, their TN, because they claim they have immigrant intent because they have nothing to go back to in Canada because they sold their home to come in. So this is vetting we've never seen before. So rule of thumb, you know, D don't sell your house before you know you've been granted entry to come into the country, but it is changing how we prep individuals for entry, um, documentation they mean, may need to have before they come in. So I do suggest you talk through counsel before sending individuals. Many may come to you and say, oh, it's so easy, I'm Canadian, I can do this myself. We're seeing that's not the case these days. Uh, so far from Mexico, we haven't really had any changes in processing at the consulate. They've been still fairly liberal. Um, one of the biggest issues is CBP itself. So Mexicans only get one-year visas, even though they can be granted permission to work for you for three years. And what we see happen is that the Customs and Border Protection are looking only at the visa and granting entry for one year instead of the three years that's permitted. So the most important part is to check their I-94 record when they come in so they're not artificially limited their ability to work in the U.S. We can't help with those corrections or we may send people outside the country to fix that, but that's a common error we see, especially in Texas, um, when crossing the border. E-visa. So this is probably going to be a bit rare for many of you out there, but these are for companies that are actually owned by a foreign company directly. So if the investor or owner or the business is a country that has a treaty with the U.S., um, I don't know how many off their hand. There's over 60 countries. Um, I'll... I'll make it easy. I'll pick Canada. It's nice, straightforward. If your U.S. business is majority owned by a Canadian entity, you can send Canadian individuals. They don't even have to be employees of the Canadian entity into the U.S. if they're going to come in to work as an executive, a manager, or what's called an essential worker. Um, so for those who have treaties, it's a great um, category uh, because E's, again, don't have an expiration. Uh, some countries, you can get a five-year visa, and every trip you make into the U.S. gives you two years of work authorization. So you do a lot of work at the front end, and then you don't have to really revisit it for a while. It's also a great visa category for entrepreneurs, so individuals who want to start up a business um, from other countries. As long as they're from one of these treaty countries, they have qualifying investment, a good business plan, can show that they intend to uh, create a business that will generate work, hire employees. It's an excellent avenue to really allow self-employment, right? You're creating your own business and hope for growth. Um, so 
I like these. I love seeing people's dreams come to play where they have this great idea of what they want to create in America. So they're really fun uh, visas that can work. Um, and if your entity happens to be owned by a foreign company or gets bought out, it could open up additional opportunities. Uh, and also spouses can work as well. And sometimes we've found where one spouse is from a treaty country but not the principal, guess who gets to own the business, right? And then the other spouse can work on an EAD. So there's some creative avenues we can use. And I've seen um, situations where perhaps a smaller company runs out of the six years of H-1B status and there's not a permanent application in the works. And um, a key employee has qualified for an E and started his own business or her own business and then contracted work back to the company. So, you know, there really are some creative solutions. I also want to mention that E... Visas technically don't have dual intent either. Um, I just met with a e uh, visa innkeeper yesterday, and she um, told me she keeps the teeny tiniest little apartment in Montreal uh, just for that purpose. So, you know, a lot of people are quite concerned nowadays when they travel. So, uh, next, Bob, we're going to talk about. Lawful permanent residence as a solution to um, H-1B cap. Yeah, I mean, all of the things we've been talking about so far are, you know, time limited, or the H-1B is time limited. And there are going to be some instances where it may be possible to skip over all of the alphabet soup, all of the non-immigrant categories, and go straight to permanent residence. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about permanent residence. But before doing that, I kind of want to have a little bit of a contest. And, and I'm going to call just 10 people. And, and um, the question is, how many people on average in the United States every year gets permanent residence? And I want you to know that the person coming the closest to correctly guessing the number of people getting green cards every year gets Deborah Schneider's Jaguar for the next year. So, Drive a Subaru. So, no, no. <laughs> the woman is quite modest. Um, so now that I've got your attention, how many people get green cards every year? 10,000. Okay, we have 10,000 on, on the floor. Um, how, how many do you think? Yes, please. 100,000. Sir? 20,000. 20,000. Uh, way in the back, what do you think? 3,000. Okay. What do you think, sir? 300,000. 300,000. One dollar. <laughs> um, yeah, right. The F, F and B yes. folks can't play. <laughs> Pardon me? Million. Oh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, this is not just for employment. You're talking about overall everybody, right? right? I'm talking about everybody. Okay. One, one, more, one more guess. 32,000. 32,000. Okay. Well, actually, we have a winner, and it is a million. Okay. Here's my point. Here is my point, to the extent I have a point. Um, <laughs> permanent residence in the U.S. system is not theoretical. And therefore, if you go down these different paths, you may have a case or, or an individual may have a case for permanent residence. Okay? And there are only four ways to get permanent residence. One is through family relationships. The most common one, at least in, in, in my experience, well, actually, the most common one being the nuclear family. A foreign national married to a U.S. citizen or a, an adult child having a, sponsoring their parents or parents who are U.S. citizens in, you know, sponsoring their, their, their uh, a ch a child. But my only point is that is one pathway to permanent residence and it may be time efficient, particularly in a marriage-based So case. marry off your employees. Right. <laughs> right. So that is one thing to look at. Number two, and, and, and in general, in general, there's about uh, 700,000 green cards issued every year based on family relationships. So at present, we're still a family-oriented immigration system. Basket number two is employment. So the overall quota is 140,000 green cards in that basket. There are certain situations, either an employer sponsoring a foreign national or a foreign national 
who is doing work of such merit or such exceedingly high capabilities, extraordinary ability, for example, that could create a pathway to permanent residence. I'm going to come back to that in just one second. Third way is the United States still has a provision affording permanent residence for individuals fearing persecution. Uh, so that's refugee and asylum law, which is a matter of considerable uh, controversy today, but it's still on the books. And then fourth is kind of the miscellaneous things, maybe the most common one being the visa lottery program. But here's my only point, if I have one. Now, um, which is that it takes, it behooves an employer, it behooves a foreign national to inventory thoroughly what their options are and what the chances might be to attain permanent resident status. Now, oftentimes, cases for permanent residents take a long period of time. So if so, it can be of minimum utility because you're dealing in these compressed time periods under the temporary visas. But in cases of family, some family uh, cases, if someone is doing work that, imp that has the potential of impacting beneficially the United States, there's something called a national interest waiver in which a, an individual, the foreign national, him or herself, can sponsor themselves for permanent residence if they are not from India or China, which are countries having unduly long backlogs in their quota lines, they can file directly to USCIS. Once the filing takes place, they would be allowed to stay in the United States. And about 120 days after they file, they get an employment card. Their employment card lets them work for you. So again, it's a matter of assessment. It's a matter of inventorying. But I do get back to the initial notion um, the, the notion that, that launched the gift of the Jaguar, that permanent residence is simply not a theoretical construct. People get it all the time, and, and it is worth looking at, okay? Lastly, again, workarounds to H-1B. How do you stay in the United States? And it's not just a question of staying in the United States, but having the authorization to, of a foreign national to do something which you want them to do, presumably to work for you. And this leads us into spousal considerations. Sometimes your main focus is on the foreign national, but for immigration purposes, the foreign national may derive a, an employment card through as the derivative to her spouse. So for example, if a sp if a spouse is is uh, in H one B, the foreign national, the 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 other spouse, spouse B, um, is qualifies for H four. H four does not carry with it employment authorization. However, under a current uh, program, if the H one B is the beneficiary of an approved called an immigrant visa petition, so someone has sponsored you know, her for permanent residence, and the immigrant visa petition is approved, then the H-4 could, at that point, apply for an employment card. Um, and it becomes extraordinarily useful and, and surprisingly widespread. Um, so it is a possibility. In addition, some of the non-immigrant visa categories we've talked about L1, E2, E3, they provide a mechanism for a spouse to, to apply for an employment card. So again, in the analysis stage, um, obviously a good deal of attention gets paid to the principal, you know, the, your, your own employee, but it definitely makes sense to widen the scope of inquiry to see if there's any kind of other relationship, mainly through a spousal relationship, to provide your employee with an employment card. And um, in the notes, we also had mentioned TPS. We'll not deal with it uh, now. Um, but again, that's a visa 
situation, classification, that provides temporary protection to foreign nationals from countries experiencing some type of situation that makes it um, infeasible to send them back. But that's a specific government program. And we are seeing con constrictions there. Okay, thank you so much.